Japanese. Admiral Halsey said Japanese is a language that will only be spoken in hell. And they wanted the eradication of every last Japanese. This it's, is in it's important to remember that at UCSF, uh, University of California and San Francisco and other universities, there are Japanese bones that are kept in their records department because they honestly thought the Japanese would be exterminated uh, during this conflict. So go on, Peter. They wanted examples for anthropological history. Yes, and, and that is mentioned in the book. But So anyway, the way Emperor Hirohito figured that he could uh, defend his empire, this was a whole empire he was responsible for, was to start studying biological warfare because this was uh, what he was expert in. And this completely intimidated his mentor. Uh, General Nogi. Name? General Nogi. Who was a shogun, uh, 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 what do you call it? Samurai. Old samurai. The, the, the yeah. tradition of the samurai. And he was uh, so uh, shocked at the warfare methods of his young uh, protege, Emperor Hirohito, who he had sternly uh, disciplined to teach him how to be a samurai sternly, and here his his pupil was being more ruthless than he could even conceive of him being a real tough son of a bitch, and he was so mortified by what the emperor was doing, the the emperor, the, the young emperor to be the prince or whatever they called him, uh, was he, he committed suicide because yes. when Emperor Hirohito was coronated. Yes, he, he couldn't, he says, and Emperor Hirohito said that he was a very fine, uh, you know, warrior, very fine warrior, but he was a coward when it came to the new warfare that was necess necessary for defending the empire. Now, what he did, he had ratcheted up, or what you call indulged in gain-of-function research, uh, to increase the potency of the yellow fever virus. The and lethality. Then, yes, and yes. And then he built this incredible navy of dirigibles, which he had uh, taken the best of what the Germans had done and what the Americans had done. Just the to Ameri explain this, this is a necessary um, interjection here. Go ahead, please. So do. people understand this. During World War I, the Germans had essentially bombed uh, London from the stratosphere. People don't realize how high the Germans got. The Germans got so high so that the, the British people, the British military, was literally impotent. There was nothing the British military could do. Their planes could not go that high to intercept the German dirigibles. And because their pilots would literally suffocate to death going up to those altitudes or freeze to death, whichever came first, uh, they could only watch in impotence while the American Naval Airship Division, it was a branch of the naval service of the German Kriegsmarine, their war navy, under the Kaiser, just dropped bombs from the stratosphere. The Germans were able to do this because they wore pressure suits. They found out the hard way that many of their men would freeze to death, suffocate, or die at such altitudes. So they were literally pioneering space travel. So when the Germans shared this technology with the Japanese, the Japanese perfected it. As the Japanese are known for, they can copy and improve. And so they took the German technology. Uh, one of their Japanese daredevils helped to perfect the pressure suit. Uh, because he did the tests for the British. The British actually conducted tests to develop pressure suits, but they couldn't find anyone to volunteer because it was suicidal. So the only person who volunteered was a Japanese man who said, I'm willing to die for my emperor and I do this for him. And so they tested the pressure suit using a Japanese man. He went home, redesigned the entire thing so that it worked better, and the Japanese deployed them in their dirigibles. Now, it was found that you can fire guns in space. Basically, the high atmosphere would render ammunition untenable for most weapons, people thought, but the Japanese found the oxygen is already in the ammunition, and so it carries its own oxygen when it's sparked, and therefore it creates its own ability to project itself. So from high altitudes, they could use the 88 cannon, which the Germans had developed, easily employable on the dirigibles, hanging off from the bottom platform, and they could pound Chinese cities into rubble. This was obviously a high security secret, 
And Americans never got to see this any more than they got to bomb the atomic bomb factories in Conan, Korea. The Americans throughout the war were bragging about, hey, we're able to bomb Japan, but you never hear the Americans say, oh, and by the way, we bombed Korea too. It's because they couldn't get past Japan to get to Korea. The anti-aircraft fire was so intense, their pilots never made it past Japan. So the Americans never bombed Korea and the atomic bomb project was untouched throughout World War II, to the point where in the book, we published the newspaper headlines where during the Korean War, the Americans are saying, oh, by the way, we're bombing atomic bomb factories that the commies got in North Korea. Because, you know, them commie gooks somehow managed to get the bomb before Stalin. Uh, there's no explanation behind it. No American ever thinks twice. So they never said, how is it the North Korean gooks got this bomb? Uh, this is before 1949, by the way, before the um, Soviets blew theirs. <laughs> so, uh, but the Americans are nevertheless bombing atomic bomb factories in North Korea. Well, they're Japanese atomic bomb factories. That's why the North Koreans were still launching World War II atomic bombs uh, until recently. They're using World War II level Japanese technology uh, because they're stuck in the past. So there you have that. And then you have the fact that, uh, well, you know, uh, Battle of Los Angeles, take it from here, dear Peter. You need to unmute. Oh, uh, yeah. All, all of this is so important uh, because, as I say, I can give you an overview. Douglas can go in ad infinitum about all of the uh, corroborative and fully detailed aspects of this. But basically, um, the Empire of Japan was being strangulated economically. Oil supply only had like a, a limited amount of oil. Uh, and, and of course, the United States was strangling Japan because they wanted control of Japan. FDR wanted control of the whole world if he could get it. And certainly, uh, Japan was under a grave threat, aside from the genocidal ambitions. That, that's uh, right. Just to put the world control under perspective, the Americans developed what was called the Rainbow War Plan. Now, anybody can look up the Rainbow War Plan, and it's perfidiously, very insultingly uh, presented as a series of defense plans. Yet, it's a series of operational plans to invade France, Germany, Britain, Canada, and Japan. Uh, they had it color-coded. Uh, in the old days, before communism was considered a threat, remember, in those days, FDR said the communists are our greatest allies. All the American academia said the same. With Evans Fortis Carl Carlson, a U.S. Marine, a card-carrying communist, uh, being so admired as the great American hero, whenever his politics were questioned, uh, then the Marines would say, well, he may be red, but he ain't yellow, which meant he's not a gook. Uh, so you can trust the reds, better red than Asian. That was the whole meaning behind what they said. People can't even read those politics or interpret them in the postmodern sense. But what happened then was that because of this pro-communism, uh, the Americans considered every other nation on earth other than Russia to be a threat, to be conquered. And so the British Empire, which used to be shown in red on the maps back in the old days, anybody can take a look at classic maps to see this, it was War Plan Red, the invasion of Britain. The invasion of Canada, a subsidiary, a dominion of the British Empire, was War Plan Crimson. And the invasion plans for Japan was War Plan Orange because they were allied with the British. In fact, that was the only British alliance, a formal military alliance, ever made by the British in a thousand years yeah. with the Japanese. That's why Emperor Hirohito was awarded by the Queen herself when he visited England the knighthood of the Garter. Yeah. So at that point, he became a knight like General Nogi, although he wasn't a samurai, he was nobility. He was a knight, and he spoke the king's English, and uh, he considered all the British he encountered to be units in mutiny. Yeah. By the way, after World War II, he said to the Brits, you better goddamn give me my order of the garter knighthood back. And the British said, yes, sir. And he <laughs> remained a knight of the order of the garter until the day he died. That's what happens when you win the war.
Very and, interesting, Douglas, but we need to get back to uh, Peter a, and see how yes. this relates to uh, our our MUFON organization. Oh, oh, MUFON theme, yes. And so, so anyway, to put it quite simply, uh, this, this whole uh, technology of dirigibles was perfected uh, and improved upon from the uh, what the Germans had done and what the Americans had done. The American, of course, the American program was sabotaged by Filipinos who were enslaved uh, during the Spanish-American uh, war. Yeah, I, I'll interject there too. This is important to emphasize. The Americans were developing a flying aircraft carrier program, which is what the dirigibles were ultimately used as. Understand that Emperor Hirohito knew that the most uh, ridiculous thing in the world is a seaborne aircraft carrier. Uh, General uh, Sikorsky of the uh, Sikorsky helicopter fame and various other emigres from communism uh, from Eastern Europe told the Americans that you cannot put any money into an aircraft carrier program. It's ridiculous. Now, the reason why is because it's simply an enormous concentration of force within a highly vulnerable platform. All of that air power in a single floating platform has nowhere to land when that platform sinks. Now, the Germans proved this when they sank the Ark Royale and various British uh, aircraft carriers uh, before the Japanese even entered the war. And so Emperor Hirohito no, knew that Japan's battleships and aircraft carriers at sea were irrelevant. They were worthless. He instead built flying aircraft carriers, which is what the dirigibles are. So much of this was stolen technology that was uh, taken from the Americans because the Americans were terrible at security. One of the reasons why was because their officer corps was incredibly spoiled. Now, my father was in the Navy. I got to know about this painfully. If anyone's ever grown up involved with the military, the first thing one is exposed to is the incredible amount of Filipinos in the American military. Uh, there are far more Filipinos in the American military than there are in the Filipino military. And uh, because the Philippines was a colony, and very dependent on American military bases for its economy, then uh, the Filipinos consider America to be heaven and they're in hell. And if they can just marry a GI or join the military, they can get to America and escape hell itself. Yeah. Um, that's still the way they feel. Uh, when it comes, this is very interesting, but it's well, it has to do with the destruction. It has to do with the destruction of the technology that is relevant to the topic. Yeah. Okay. Why didn't the Americans have their own battle dirigibles? So uh, well, I understand. Let, let me get, let me let me kind of summarize this more. Uh, well, Douglas. well, understand it was Japanese dressed as Filipinos because the Americans couldn't tell Asians apart. The Japanese infiltrated the Filipino uh, servants corps. Now, the American Navy had what they called the stewards. These were Filipinos who shined their officers' shoes and served them dinner, prepared everything for them, and babysat their kids. These Filipino stewards, as a force, were far larger than the Filipino defense forces, which is why the Filipinos had nothing to stand against the Japanese. So these Filipinos who served the American officers' corps numbered in the thousands, and the Japanese infiltrated, the Americans couldn't tell that they were not Filipino. And therefore the Japanese took the advantage of this situation to destroy every American flying aircraft carrier. The Akron, the Macon, the Shenandoah, all of America's flying dirigibles, which would unleash planes on the enemy were destroyed and sab uh, by sabotage, which is quite self-evident when you take a look at their destruction. And the Americans declared the flying aircraft carrier program was a failure. So they invested in seaborne carriers while Hirohito dominated the flying carrier concept, which could fly in above America's radar into American airspace with impunity and then unleash hell on earth. It's by this, is the, this is the key point, and this is all the background uh, that, the, the, you know, they essentially destroyed the American uh, impetus for the dirigibles. Now, perfected them. And of course, what they were doing with the uh, with these weapons of war, they were going into the ravines of China and basically uh, destroying entire populations in a limited 
uh, ravine in China. Yes, to, to put this in, let again, me, the, let me just, sure. Let me just take over here, Douglas, so that I can summate some things and address some questions that are coming up. Because this this gets incredibly detailed, and I think you've well, established. Well, I, th I think the important point to remember that everyone needs to know is that China lives in incredibly isolated pockets, and their communities, because of the warlord centuries, were highly fortressed. There was no yes, way to yes, really. I, I'm, I'm yeah. getting to that. Yes. Okay. It, it, but this was a contained, uh, and and of course they had uh, many tanks, which we have pictures of in the book. Many tanks and uh, the Japanese tanks. bombs that would be unleashed and spread this yellow fever virus all over. Now, the Americans knew what was going on in China because they had a presence there, and they, they very much knew this and were very aware of this. Now, what happened was uh, in after Pearl Harbor, which was only six or seven weeks, on February 24th, 25th, they unleashed these dirigibles. And of course, because Emperor Hi Hirohito was a marine biologist, he studied the currents, something that Americans knew nothing about. The Japanese Kuroshio current is it would go up the coast of Japan, across the uh, the ocean, the top of the Pacific Ocean, under Alaska, down the coast of Canada, and into the Pacific current, and would unleash these uh, first off these dirigibles, and they parked themselves uh, off the coast, Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, and uh, actually, uh, this was a intimidation tactic uh just six or seven weeks after pearl harbor and You're of talking course about the, the jet stream correct that's yes, correct uh, yeah yes 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 and this is something the americans were completely ignorant of and it only takes about three days to get across and well, it actually takes hours but three days at the longest yes yes so uh this was a, an incredible uh asset that the emperor had figured out through his own genius he's not considered a war criminal. He's considered, you know, a kindly old fumbler of to just listen to his, uh, you know, the politicians. This is not the case at all. This is another myth that was created. He was, in the truest sense of the word, a war criminal, but he was also a hero to his empire. And he was far smarter than any of his adversaries, having outlived them all uh, and having preserved his empire. Now, what uh, basically he unleashed all of these huge dirigibles, and this scared the daylights out of the American military. And of course, there is extensive press coverage that reported it. Uh, and of course, they and, and of course, what happened was all of these uh, there were crashes, there were planes, and the American military was taught very quickly to say these are aliens. And there are even reports of this. And people who gave firsthand accounts or the newspaper reports what happened. There was also an altered photograph uh, to make it look like it was a so called UFO. Yes. And basically, what happened after the, the Battle of Los Angeles is they thought that the emperor was unleashing the yellow fever, fever virus. So they created a vaccine, and the vaccine was supposed to inoculate their troops, but you, it takes at least 10 years to test a vaccine. Uh, something that has been a, a point of contention lately with, with uh, the COVID stuff. But anyway, it killed some 50,000 of the American troops yes, and yes. disabled some 300,000 others. This is a big secret. And one of my friends in the uh, Disclosure Network had told me many years ago, he says, the reason there's no disclosure is because uh, there's so many dead bodies. There's so many dead bodies. And the dead bodies are not, you know, aliens abducting uh, people. It's it's the dead people of World War II. Yes, collateral and damage. Collateral damage. And, and so a whole myth has been created around the Battle of Los Angeles. Movies have been made about it. Um, only in fairly recent times has it been uh, first motion picture unit and this is the 1990s, they, they said, oh, this is Hollywood was working lockstep with the government, the Office of War Information, and to, to create all these movies to make you think there were all of these aliens and whatnot. And the, the myth was, this was the first myth, the Battle of Los Angeles. There are even uh, documents by FDR alluding to extraterrestrials, which is a disinformation ploy, uh, because it's clear 
you have uh, 30 years of uh, 23 years of the History Channel, and you have no aliens. You just have a very, very popular show uh, feeding a myth uh, that is, this is not to say their extraterrestrials don't exist. This is not a forum on extraterrestrials. What it is, is a forum on disinformation and lies and that are definitely perpetrated mm -hmm. to make people think and hide these crimes. I also want to address, before we go further and go into Roswell, is address some of the things of the, the chat rooms about, about saying that uh, um, D Douglas is uh, very angry. Well, I, I would say that Douglas is very angry. And he used to be a lot more angry. Uh, he's less angry than he was now because uh, his his information is getting out there. It has a lot, of, and it's never intelligently challenged. Uh, the only way people can challenge it is through their own ignorance and saying, well, what's this, what's that? Ask well, questions. I, I think it's an insult to say that I'm angry. First off, as I said, uh, I'm drunk. Uh, but beyond that, that's no excuse. Uh, if you're not rendered angry by what I've explained. Exactly. You're I an idiot. I was getting to that. It was getting to that. It's justifiable anger because this is genocide that has been perpetrated uh, by our governments. And you should be angry about it. And it's hard to be angry about it if you don't get yourself educated on it. So it's like, yes, angry, correct, correct emotion. You should be outraged at it. Yes. And also saying that he's racist, coming off racist and hateful. Well, <laughs> well racism Talk is, about desperation. Well, yeah, well, this is what FDR was extremely racist. The United States is extremely racist. And this is why we're going through all of this woke stuff right now, because it's, it's time to own up to some of this, uh, you know, horrible... Uh, perpetration of racial violence that's taken place. Unfortunately, so much of the, the woke issues become manipulated and steered to make them uh, less understandable. And, and of course, the people who are perpetrating the woke stuff are ignoring the stuff that we're talking about, right, which is right. the real right. genocide that Thank took you. place and the Americans' uh, genocidal ambition uh, to say nothing of the Spanish-American War, all these documents that he was, the Spanish-American War ended up at the Presidio. It was in the Pacific Theater. He burned these documents. Um, I mean, how it was millions of people that were killed in the Philippines. That's, that's quite true. Just so people understand the Battle of Los Angeles, why it's so important. We're talking about just a few weeks after Pearl Harbor, and the dirigibles could not carry that amount of biocidals without it being a one-way trip because of the sheer weight of the biocidals if they were fully loaded that would have been a one-way trip so when hirohito sent the dirigibles to force the americans to surrender the ones that overwhelmed uh the americans in the sky by appearing like independence day uh between the dropping of the hiroshima and nagasaki bombs uh, ordering that the America stand down and uh, cease uh, hostilities. Uh, and the Americans responded very quickly, knowing they had lost the war. Uh, they knew they had lost the war because their nuclear weapon had not destroyed Amer the Japanese industrial production of planes that could reach the United States. They knew they had lost the war for so many reasons. One of them was that the Japanese had conducted Operation Ichigo, which had destroyed all American air bases in China, cut off Chiang Kai-shek, who switched to the side of the Japanese, which is why nationalist China, which was the first nation to declare war against the Axis long before Poland, uh, was ultimately thrown out of the Security Council of the United Nations and replaced by the communists, who the Americans had always favored, which is why Chiang Kai-shek went Japanese in 1945. So when it came to the Battle of Los Angeles, you're talking about the Japanese conducting what's called the show of force. And when they used the Kurashiwa, the black current, and its jet stream, which when the Americans first tried to bomb Japan, found they were hitting headwinds 300, 400 miles an hour that they never knew existed, 
which forced them to hit the waves and go in low above the ocean itself to bomb Japan, which meant that the majority of them got shot down. This is why islands like Iwo Jima were invaded. The Americans will tell you was because of all the Arab men who were getting shot down over Japan. Well, taking advantage of nature itself, because the jet stream only blows in one direction. Emperor Hirohito sent the dirigibles on the jet stream, then used the California current to go down south, and then went home on the equinoctial current along the equator, which at that time, the Japanese empire stretched to the equator. So when they did this, which was all they needed to do at the loss of a few planes they had sent out to run interference, and the Americans published in their headlines, Jap sh plane shot down uh, at Easton Hollywood at Fifth Emission in Los Angeles. They gave street addresses. Kids were picking up souvenirs from these planes and called in years later to radio talk shows saying, I stripped a parachute off a dead Jap pilot back in 1941. Well, then the Americans had to isolate Los Angeles. They said, first off, everyone must be infected with aerosolized yellow jack. The yellow fever must have gotten everyone. They're going to become a contagion. We've got to prevent vectoring. So they sent in all these military divisions and they said, if anyone comes out of Los Angeles, you kill them. They were under orders to shoot to kill their fellow Americans. And the troops said, well, what about us? They said, you're protected because we're going to give you these experimental vaccines, which were made from aborted babies and cadavers and shit. And they said, nothing's ever been tested. The FDA hasn't approved it, but by God, you're going to get it. Or you're disobeying orders and you'll be shot. So, so I understand. I understand that Hirohito's idea was to use these dirigibles to deliver bioweapons to the U.S. And uh, that was the uh, well. well whole I, idea. This is the main point of the Battle of Los Angeles. The point that has to be made, which most people don't comprehend. You had approximately fifty-one thousand active duty, experienced military personnel with symptomatic hepatitis, who ultimately died. They were terminally hospitalized. And then you had 330,000 soldiers that had to be drummed out of service because they were simply unfit to serve. They were crippled the rest of their lives. But this was not a result of uh, any bioweapon that Hirohito No, dropped. it was American This was vaccine. our own vaccine. You, you, that did, but right? what happened was it stretched the war for another five years. This was the equivalent of the Americans losing four and a half divisions. So when they finally entered active operations in the Pacific conflict, all they had was a single American division to confront the Japanese in the Pacific. That's why it. Did, why did Hirohito not send over a uh, dirigible and really drop bioweapons? He could have wiped because out the Because he was asking the Americans all this time, just open your markets. All we want is free trade. You can't trade with a population that doesn't exist. If he killed the Americans, who's going to pay to fix Japan for all the damage that they're doing? So that's why he had to force them to surrender. He would have killed them all if he had to, but he didn't have to because FDR died. Yeah. Then how when Truman the took... How come the dirigibles didn't get shot down by all the uh, anti-aircraft that we had? Was it too high? They were too high. The anti-aircraft fire kept falling back to Earth and killing Americans. This is verifiable this is how on high record. was how high was the uh, dirigible do they know yes they were flying at a ceiling that was stratospheric and level but then had to lower themselves enough to be seen when they lowered themselves enough to be seen they were clearly identified on radio as dirigibles which is what the americans said there is a dirigible flying over los angeles uh, <laughs> japanese planes are over los angeles this made the headlines all of this was in print and on the airwaves. I understand that the dirigibles could have planes hanging on the bottom of them. Is That's that the correct. These the were planes? flying aircraft carriers. They unleashed their planes that way, and some of them got shot down because the planes were running interference. By the way, some of the bullets did reach the, the dirigibles because they had to lower themselves to a level where they could be visualized. And because they were lowering themselves to a visual identification level and therefore had to unleash the planes to run interference, then what they were doing was rendering themselves vulnerable. But they were practically invulnerable. Understand that you have a central, very large balloon that is surrounded by about eight or nine very large balloons, smaller than the central balloon, that are the subsidiary balloons. And when you're flying underneath this massive silk cover, because Asia had domination over silk, because they, 
silk is grown in Asia. Uh, they basically had a large silk shell to render them aerodynamic. So the Americans called these flying hamburgers. Uh, this is in highly classified documents where they were referenced. Now, these so-called flying hamburgers were basically invulnerable because even when the Americans shot down or burst one of the balloons, it's not like it's going to explode immediately. Even though they're running on hydrogen peroxide, which is highly explosive, you have to have a flame. You have to have other factors occur where it blows up. Nevertheless, because the Americans have a monopoly on helium, all of their flying aircraft carriers floated on helium, which is much slower, whereas hydrogen peroxide gives greater lift, much more power capacity, and is much faster, but nevertheless, highly explosive. So when the Japanese got a balloon punctured, they dropped it into the Pacific where the U.S. Navy recovered one of the balloons, and this is exactly what they themselves report right after the Battle of Los Angeles. We recovered a super massive amount of silk like it was from a balloon. <laughs> this is publicly on record. The U.S. Navy recovered it. Uh, and then after that, they went into information control mode and told everyone uh, it, it, it was aliens. They wanted America not only to look invulnerable, but also they had to hide their own crime against their own troops. When you had that many men die, uh, America had no manpower left. And one third throughout the war, uh, in order to make certain the Americans had nothing, Hirohito invaded Alaska. So the Aleutian Islands, a thousand miles of American territory were occupied by the Japanese throughout World War II. The Americans themselves have to admit to this. It's publicly accessible. And so the Americans built the Trans-American Highway. This had to require cooperation with the British Empire because it went through Canada. The Americans spent one third of all of their manpower, one third of all of their war materials, all of their finance throughout the Pacific War went into retaking Alaska. And because of that, they had no units left for the Pacific other than a single division at the start of the war. Uh, and there weren't many to follow after that. Beyond that, they could have bombed Japan from the Aleutian Islands like that. There would have been no island hopping campaign. The Aleutian Islands stretch all the way to Japan. The Americans could have just bombed out of the Aleutian Islands, but they couldn't because Hirohito occupied the Aleutian Islands. That was the whole Battle of Midway. He sacrificed four carriers to occupy Alaska, which was the main point of that operation. So he won the Battle of Midway, but the Americans will propagandize it as an American Trafalgar. It's preposterous. So when the Americans were encountering the first site of the dirigibles, they, they knew they existed. And at the point they knew they existed, that was a factor they had to factor in throughout the war and never knew how to compensate for it. What few jets they developed were deployed to the Pacific. Uh, none of the aircraft they had were capable of reaching the dirigibles any more than the British could with the German dirigibles in World War I. Uh, the dirigibles would fly in over American radar, not be sighted, literally in space for all intents and purposes, then drop down where they could drop their damage. Yeah. And now you also uh, contend that these dirigibles were involved in the Roswell incident? That's quite correct. Peter will take it from here. Well, I, I want to uh, just add a, an anecdote here or just make a comment. We're not going to digress into it, but the whole heart project in Alaska was uh, created later to jam the Kuroshio current. That was its initial impetus because this current, uh, they, you know, this makes the United States vulnerable. Witness the recent Chinese balloon. Uh, that, that rides on that current. So, yes, this was the initial uh, agenda of the Heart Project was to jam that current. Now, somebody has a question in the chat room. If the LA invasion was Japanese warships, how did they navigate a balloon so accurately across the Pacific? And how many planes could each carry? Could you answer that question, Douglas? Sure. In terms of the planes that we they could carry, um, you're talking about... Uh, the amount is not that much. It didn't really matter because what they're deploying from the dirigibles themselves and from the planes, which would fly, fly miles out and distribute more. You're talking about porcelain bombs. This is important. This is what they developed, perfected in China. They're made out of porcelain because they're carrying living biological organisms. And uh, they were dropped early in the morning in the China war because they found out that if you drop them too late in the afternoon, they'll basically die because of the heat. If you drop them too late at night, they die because of the cold. So it'd be early in the morning when temperatures were most ambient, they would tend to drop their porcelain bombs carrying biocidals. 
China's very structure allowed them to annihilate all pockets of resistance while maintaining the population alive, which they needed for the market, for labor, for an empire. So it was only pockets of resistance they would drop their biocidals on, and it won them the China front. This is ultimately why Chiang Kai-shek had to go Japanese, go Axis, and the communists were the only people resisting them. They were supported by the Soviet Union and the U.S. When it came to these porcelain bombs carried by their planes and by, of course, their dirigibles, you've got a one-two punch. And, of course, they just appear in America. They're invulnerable. And then the planes can go lower and uh, basically drop their biocidals. But this was part of an ongoing strategy that was far more developed than people realize. Their Fugo bombs throughout World War II had caused fires that allowed the Japanese to map the wind currents. Because the Japanese were doing this throughout the war with thousands of Fugo balloon bombs generating massive forest fires, the Americans themselves will tell you the National Park Service confirms that had the war gone on another year, the entire Pacific Northwest would have burned to the ground. But that wasn't Japan's intent, not to destroy a lot of lumber. Instead, Hirohito proved to the Americans I can take you out like that with a single balloon bomb that he unleashed in the middle of a massive rain front into America. It rode the mapped currents uh, through a rain front, no less, and destroyed the power lines that connected Hanford Arsenal to Los Alamos. Hanford Dam is what produced all the electricity for Los Alamos. He shut down the American atomic bomb project. This way he showed the Americans, I know where Los Alamos gets its, pro its power from. I know what you're doing. And so the Americans declared a massive alert. The Los Alamos was shut down for 72 hours, three days. And the Americans, again, were proven so vulnerable, so impotent, so powerless that they knew they had lost. Uh, so when it comes to all of these factors combined with the Sentoku submarines, the Sentoku submarines were the largest submarines ever built prior to the advent of the nuclear submarine. And they carried the Hiru, the Hiryu Flying Dragon Bombers. These were the medium-range bombers that were built around the Little Boy Atomic Bomb Ordnance. They were on the America's Atlantic coast. Bear in mind, because the Americans had killed 3 million Filipinos in the Muslim region, the Muslims fought on Japan's side. Because of that, the largest Japanese city in the Philippines was Davao, D-A-V-A-O. That's the city where the Filipino president uh, was born, who hated America so much and wanted to go to the side of Russia and China. Uh, I forget his name. He was, recent, he was recently voted out and they put in uh, Marcos's son, who was also a Japanese collaborator. And we're, when we're, came, digressing, we're digressing, we're digressing. It's not digressing. These, we these, need to get these submarines were how the Americans also threatened America from the Atlantic. The Japanese threatened the Americans from the Atlantic. Yeah. You keep saying this is digressing, but it's all part of the equation of the multiple threat projection that America founded sure. its own multiple threat projection on. I understand. Um, Peter, you said that the HARP uh, antenna array that we have was to uh, destroy, to reverse the... Uh, the air, the jet stream, was that what you were referring yes, to? Yes, that's why the only civilian access to information on HARP monitoring whether it goes active or not is in the University of Tokyo. The University of Tokyo monitors HARP for whenever it goes active because it has the potential to reverse the jet stream and did so a few times when the Americans tested it. Peter, if you would unmute and uh, come back to join the conversation. Personally, I believe that was a digression myself, but... It was a digression, and I wanted to point it out because, you see, uh, Douglas has got his finger on so much. This is like inside defense stuff that the world's just not going to hear. And so much of what goes on in the UFO world is the, the government leading people on a string. It's leading the UFO people on a string, and this is an opportunity for people to get educated. So uh, we're getting an extensive... Uh, very detailed briefing. We're very lucky to have Douglas with with us tonight. If it was just me, it would be much more uh, abbreviated uh, because my knowledge of it is not as extensive. But uh, what we want to do here is uh, what was what took place at the Battle of Los Angeles. Of course, were these dirigibles? There were also. It's important here the Fugo balloon bombs. This was in addition to the dirigibles. These were balloons that were sending 
in mass across the Kuroshio current, uh, and they were dropping incendiary devices and creating firestorms across the Western United States. And the purpose of these, with the submarines Douglas was talking about, they would have planes attached to them that would go and monitor the, the wind currents as a result of watching the fires. Yes. Watching the fires. And he had the currents of the United States so well mapped out that he could deliver uh, he could deliver the dirigibles and or the Fugo balloon bombs with uh, with, with these porcelain bombs and literally destroy the United States, destroy every living person on the United States. And this is was key to what uh, becomes known as the Roswell deception, because to, to get to the we're here, we got about 45 minutes here. We have so basically what happens is at the end of World War II, uh, or not the end of World War II, excuse me, the Hiroshima bomb. When the Hiroshima bomb goes on August 6th, the emperor then sends uh, three super dirigibles across the ocean. They get there pretty quick, and their target is. Tanapa Army Airfield, which we now know as Area 51. Two of them arrive. One crashes. The two that arrive are fully equipped with the tanks, planes. It shows, he's showing the Americans, this is what we've got. We've also got these uh, weapons. These are immediately flown to Fort Detrick on the East Coast to examine them. And indeed, the Americans then realize that the emperor isn't joking. He has enough uh, biocidals to kill everyone on Earth. Yeah, yeah. If let alone, yeah America, let alone, yeah, everyone alone, let alone America. So basically, at that point on August fifteenth, it's the Americans accept the emperor's terms, terms, and his terms are that he can remain on as emperor. The Americans can do whatever window dressing they want, and Douglas's mother is part of these talk down negotiations. Thank now. You. This sets the stage for the Roswell incident, which I will fast forward to. There's a lot more detail of the final days of, of what happens in the time period of the Hiroshima bombing. But in any case, what happens is uh, there's the 1946 uh, Operation High Jump yes. uh, with Admiral Byrd. And this, uh, this is where the Americans are trying to go down and get rid of the German base, the Germans who had uh, relocated to Antarctica with their flying craft, and which is a whole other yeah, story. Just so a people under show. understand this very succinctly, understand throughout the war, the large Sentoku submarines were bearing the Japanese atomic bombs to threaten the Atlantic seaboard. Their basic workhorse submarines each carried a reconnaissance plane by which they mapped the winds. Their basic submarines could do that. Uh, but when it comes to the Germans, the Germans gave the Japanese the maps to all of the shipping they had sunk, and this is what provided the very large Sentoku submarines, their camouflage. As large as the submarines were, they didn't appear on sonar because the ships the Germans had sunk were larger than the Titanic, these various merchant ships, so they could hide the bulk of a Sentoku submarine. All of this the Germans confounded with their development of Die Glock which was the so-called bell, which Americans, of course, try to comprehend, and they do a semi-good job of piecing information together. But Adolf Hitler had made a deal with Francisco Franco, whose civil war he had helped Francisco Franco win. And so Hitler said, in return, since you're not joining us as a formal member of the Axis, that's fabulous. You stay on as a neutral power, and we're going to take advantage of that. In return for us helping you win your war and keeping you in power, I, by God, I want the Canary Islands to host Die Glock, the bell bomb. And so uh, the Americans received a demonstration of the power of the bell bomb in two ways. One of them was by Ganges Island in the Pacific, and the other was by the Canary Islands themselves. Uh, in the Ganges Islands in the Pacific, People can look this up and they'll say, oh, uh, various search engines will tell you it's an imaginary island. But my father laid foot on that island. It was an island under contestation between the Americans and the Japanese. The Japanese occupied it. 
uh, by using Diglock, which basically it causes enormous displacement of the space-time continuum in the immediate area, they made the island disappear. The island is no longer on the maps because it physically no longer exists. So the Americans will say it's an imaginary island, but it certainly existed and is on globes and maps. I have a globe in my own home in which Genghis Island is on that globe. Mm -hmm. So uh, aside from that, the Germans triggered a landslide in the Canary Islands and said, have your geophysicists confirm this. If we make the entire volcano island disappear using Diglock, the tsunami that's raised, unlike in the Pacific, due to the geomorphological structure, the geophysical nature of the Atlantic, will wipe out the American Atlantic seaboard, and you're all going to die. Yeah. So the Americans effectively surrendered to the Reich. They stood back and stood down while the Reich conducted its exodus to escape into massive caverns they found underground, not in any mythical hollow earth, but Grand Canyon-sized caverns within its crust. This is called Unterland. They escaped into Unterland primarily through Antarctica, though entrances to it exist at both poles and, of course, into Bit, which the Nazis confirmed the existence of Unterland thereby in the first place with their Tibetan expedition. When okay. the Germans went down in, rather, the Nazis, these were pure Nazis, not Germans. The Nazi party was always only 10% of the German population. When the Nazi elite, along with many of their loyalists, went into Unterland via the Antarctica. These were the last great battles of the Atlantic. The Americans tried first to get them with their Navy. The Air Force did not exist. And then they uh, turned uh, towards the Army when the Navy failed. Then uh, back to Operation High Jump, the Naval Expedition with Peter Moon. Well, yes, thank you for that. Um, so, but basically uh, what the, the Americans wanted to do was Defeat the Germans. Once and for all. The Nazis. Yeah. yeah, but they couldn't because, as they say, that Operation High Jump was an abject military failure. It came home way early from what it was expected to do. And they had this, what I consider, an imbecilic idea to, to try and operate these Japanese dirigibles and learn how to use them themselves and go down there and take out the Germans. And here you're, you would have been... Uh, using dirigibles uh, against an underground colony that had advanced flying craft. Uh, it just sounds absurd. Nevertheless, this is what they were thinking of doing. And they were created for a very small uh, Japanese that were barely five feet, if that. They were called the Yakuza, the criminal class of the Japanese who were loyal to the emperor um, and who ritually would have their pinky finger cut off uh, as a form of atonement. Uh, so most of these Japanese airmen had three fingers. And, and shaved their body hair completely. Shaved their body hair completely to avoid, because these, these dirigibles were made with, uh, as he said, hydrogen peroxide uh, and not helium. So they were very flammable. And one had to be very careful. Now, because the Americans were too big to get into the, the core of, of these operating, they had to force the Japanese to fly, to fly them themselves. Them. And this created a big problem. Now, uh, some of these, these Japanese despised what they were doing. They didn't want to do this. And But before what happened, and eventually one of these was sent uh, in a, a test flight over Roswell, but before, and it's just a couple weeks before the Roswell incident, is the incident with Kenneth Arnold, uh, which has coined the term flying saucer. We have a picture of this in the book. Uh, Douglas, explain what happened with some of these Japanese tried to escape with the planes, these yes. Zimmer skimmers, yes. explain that. These are the, this is how the fl word, fl or the flying saucer got created as a very important, uh, iconic term. In a our, a, a in trope. Our this is this is a mnemonic trope in the American mind. 
So uh, everyone understands this. The Americans were a very good capitalist society in that they would sell whatever made them a profit. And if defense contractors are willing to sell to their own government, they're usually willing to sell to anybody. As a matter of fact, uh, there was a American plane developed by Sikorsky, the same general from Russia who said to the Americans, don't invest in aircraft carriers. And this plane wound up being sold to the Japanese because the Americans wouldn't buy it. Uh, the Americans, appropriately enough, codenamed it Dick. But the whole point about this is that because the Americans would sell to anybody, uh, even though Zimmerman didn't want to really cooperate with the Japanese and really never consciously sold to them, a lot of Japanese were able to steal his materials because he was developing planes for America's flying aircraft carriers. And his blueprints instead were stolen and went to Japan. Uh, this was by all the Japanese dressed as Filipino stewards, who the Americans never found out about until all their entire aircraft carrier, flying aircraft carrier fleet was wiped out from the skies. Uh, it's the equivalent as if their entire carrier force was sunk, yet the Americans hide it from history. But if you look it up, you'll find out everything I say is true. As for the Americans with the bomb idea, uh, the point is that the Yakuza were loyal to the emperor just in the same sense that the American mafia cooperated with the allies to reestablish themselves on Sicily, where Mussolini had ejected them from. When it came to the Yakuza, they were authorized by the, Indi by the emperor to surrender themselves because this is what he needed to do to demonstrate to the Americans what he had. They obeyed their orders, but like the rest of the Asian American prisoners, they were never released. Uh, at the point that the Asian prisoners were kept in America, all the ones that I talked about who surrendered, they were never released, and these Yakuza were never sent home. They died here in America. Those that were able to escape used some of these Zimmer skimmers that were uh, carried normally on their, the fuselage of the battle dirigibles, and they flew off towards Mexico, tried to make a break for it. This is what our man uh, Kenneth Arnold saw, and uh, after he saw that, he identified them as these circular airplanes, and then the Americans said, no, hold up this picture of a German flying wing Horton and tell people it looked like this. So we show this in the book. His original sketch is clearly a Zimmer skimmer, and he was a trained pilot. He knew how to sketch an aircraft. So then when it came to what the Americans had him hold up a picture of, oh, say it's a Horton flying wing, then we get uh, misinformation uh, publishers and peddlers like uh, Annie Jacobson, who then said, yeah, it was a Horton flying wing, based on what the Americans forced him to hold up. If anyone reads the Roswell Deception, they get all the details. But now, Arnold, when, Arnold said that these uh, planes were going uh, over a thousand miles an hour. Were the he Zimmer was changing his story as time went on. That? His original story was quite different, just like with people who witnessed the Battle of Los <laughs> Angeles. He was visited by American physicists and people of respect over the years. It, you may as well go by what he said at the end of his life. At the end of his life, his daughter published a book and said, he said they were angels. And that's a fact. So you may as well go with that story as well. The real story that he sketched out at the beginning, along with what he said, along with the witnesses at Roswell, including the entire family that became famous for it, they were all basically converted throughout their lives. Uh, their community depended on it at Roswell. Uh, and with that, uh, I give it back to Peter. Well, yeah, and I, you said Mexico. Weren't they escaping to British Columbia or someplace? Or? They were trying to make it to Mexico first, then switch to British Columbia. I, well, think, I think that, yeah, it could have been that they were going in different directions so that they couldn't have been uh, uh, caught. But definitely by the time Arnold saw them, they were in a string, the ones he saw, which were not necessarily all of them. Because definitely the, the documents I dealt with said the biggest break was towards Mexico. And the secondary break was definitely towards uh, Canada. They were trying to make the border in either direction. But Mexico makes more sense. Uh, the well, one thing, they're much ahead. closer to Canada. Yeah, it was closer to Canada, but Mexico makes more sense. Certainly those that went towards Mexico, the documents I was dealing with, were never caught. The ones that went towards Canada were never caught either. Uh, the ones that were closer, but they were breaking in two directions to ensure the greater chances of their escape. When Kenneth saw the ones he saw, they were the ones that were probably going towards Canada. That makes sense because he was in that area, the Pacific Northwest. But when it comes to what he saw, uh, he definitely sketched it out the way he did. And uh, none of these, it, basically the Americans lost all their discraft in that mass breakout. 
And because they lost all the disc craft, the only thing they had left was another strategic aircraft, the Manta bomber that was uh, delivered under the uh, fuselage of the battle dirigible that they were trying to test out with a dummy, an inert atomic bomb, a, a dud atomic bomb, an inert one. That is one of the things discovered at the Roswell crash site, along with the bodies that went on uh, for miles. The cordon was for miles that the Americans established immediately, which they couldn't have done if this was anything spontaneous. Uh, Peter, take it from there, of course. Yes, and it's very important to realize um, that we've been indoctrinated very strongly uh, with sleight of hand uh, with this Roswell incident to say, oh, well, the the Air Force was uh, doing weather balloons. And of course, everybody scoffs at that and goes, ha, 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 we don't believe it. The, the government's lying to us. There's really aliens. But the Air Force wasn't even existing when Roswell happened. It didn't even exist. So they're saying the Air Force was playing with, with weather balloons. There was no Air Force. Uh, the Air Force was created after Roswell, shortly yes. thereafter. That's, so that's right. This is the absurdity that people are indoctrinated. Now, the, the Kenneth Arnold incident occurs just like a week or two before the Roswell incident. So it's like, oh, the aliens are flying over uh, Washington State, and now they're crashing in... Uh, Everywhere. <laughs> in, in, well, in Roswell, and it's like, what is this? And then they issue a press release, uh, which makes it look like it's a flying saucer, makes everybody think it's a flying saucer, and then they withdraw it thinking, oh, no, it's not a flying saucer, which makes everybody think it is a flying saucer. They perfected that technique at Los Angeles. Yeah. yeah, they perfected that technique at the Battle of Los Angeles. Um, and later on, uh, as I said, it was the clearly identifiable UFO uh, profile from Surrey, New England, from uh, the from actually England itself, that they actually impose into the center of the searchlights. You can actually see that. We talk about this in the book. Um, the important thing to understand is that, don't forget, there was a crash later at Kingman, Arizona, where the prisoners somehow speak English. Uh, of course, all of the prisoners of war had to learn English. The uh, There was the crash in uh, Eli, Nevada. All the same, it's, it's the Akaza, bodies that could only were the only ones who could fit in these craft uh people will try to hide it by misinformation saying that they're deformed children they'll try anything none of that makes sense you're not going to use deformed children who are developmentally disabled to even try to fly an aircraft that's no point uh you might as well just send them up to die uh in a in a single shot experiment but um peter do take it from there yeah and i, I gotta address a, a comment in the room thank you uh 21 have left the room i'm not aware of any yellow fever outbreak after the LA attack. Well, let me explain. Uh, it was clearly stated. Yeah, you can look this up. No, let me clearly state there was no yellow fever outbreak because there was no yellow fever virus, as Doug was stated. It would be too heavy to put all of this stuff. It was a scare. It was an intimidation because the uh, American army knew that he was uh, using yellow fever virus in China. He was only trying to scare the Americans because he wanted peace. He wanted to open up the markets. So it's like if people, it's like, it's like how ignorant can you be to say, okay, this isn't fitting my prescribed paradigm. I'm being fooled. They might think you're trying to fool Douglas with all of your incredible information. But however, uh, no, Douglas is not the one fooling you. Douglas is telling you the truth. And he's telling you the truth from a very uncomfortable position for yourselves if you're an American, because look at Douglas's, uh, you know, half Japanese, Chinese, his mother was Chinese and Japanese, and he understands Asia better than anybody. And this story goes far deeper than what he's saying tonight. This is only the window dressing of what's going on in the world today. And the White House actually listens to him because they want to know what's going on in Asia. Because mm -hmm. their State Department officials are too agenda-driven or just too plain uninformed to really know. This went on during the Trump administration. We watched it. And we could go deeper into this. We're not going to go into it tonight. Uh, but it's like, okay, uh, th there is so much more to this. But to get back to Roswell, 
um, the crash uh, that happened was these Yakuza immolating themselves. They didn't want, and you know, we know the Japanese aren't afraid to die. Uh, they were being held subject. They figure it was better to die and blow up the ship, which was very easy to do, than to become, continue to be prisoners of war after the war had already ended. But this the war was still on. The war was still still well, legally on in 1947. It was still on, correct. But after the cessation of hostility, which yeah. ended in 1946. So they were still being held. And they, they self-immolated. And this essentially was the Roswell crash. And as Douglas said, the army was ready for it. They, had, they were all waiting to pick it up. And then there's the whole myth uh, that was created. Douglas can explain this better than I can starting with Jesse Marcel and the whole uh, nonsense that ensued from then, and it was resurrected with the Philip Corso book. And this was all the, the later reinvention of the myth or reprisal Retreading. of the myth yes. was done under the tutelage of Colonel Michael Aquino, uh, the Satanist from the Presidio, that Douglas was by orders of his job forced to serve as a library liaison for, which yes. is a whole nother story, but that's, yes. so go ahead, Douglas. By, by the Take way, the first there. thing, the first thing that uh, the senior Marceau said, who was the poor sap who found some remnants, uh, he saw the writing and he said, and this is in print, it was delivered during his interrogation. He said, the writing was Japanese or Chinese. It was Chinese or Japanese. Those were his words he repeated multiple times. It was either Chinese or Japanese, even though he couldn't pronounce the words. Uh, having no knowledge of the culture, uh, the uh, fire department, as Keith Call, a dear friend of ours who has been to Roswell many times and talked to the uh, children of the fire department, he, could, he would testify to this under oath. He said the grandchildren of the Roswell fire department that responded said the bodies were clearly Japanese. Sergeant Melvin Brown said the exact same thing. He said they were yellow, uh, burnt orange by the fire, uh, and turned gray with rigor mortis. And he began to talk about this to his children when man first walked on the moon. And suddenly seeing a man walk on, walk on the moon triggered him to basically break his oath of silence. Uh, it was at that moment that Colonel Michael Aquino was recalled from Vietnam. And he was told, uh, we need a PSYOP. You're brilliant. We've seen what you've done in Vietnam. Uh, we need you here in the United States. And so he approached uh, the community at Roswell and told their community elders, you don't need to worry about the fact that Lyndon Baines Johnson is moving out the 405th Air Force Base, which later on became, you know, was an Air Force Base later, originally an Army base. Uh, and of course, when the Roswell men themselves were asked about the bodies, you know, the child-sized coffins, uh, they basically admitted to drinking on duty. They just said, oh, we use that to smuggle alcohol in. Well, since every base has a wet bar, which during off hours anybody can go to and drink at, uh, what they're saying is we drink on duty. And these were the guys responsible for the only atomic bomb wing in existence, as they would claim. So uh, you have that incriminating factor as to their own credibility. Uh, but uh, other than that, uh, Aquino said he would make certain Roswell would become the major Gorye, the new uh, Lourdes of a new religion. And he created it, the religion of ufology. And uh, the elders became uh, the beneficiaries of enormous profits thereafter. Uh, and of course, uh, Michael Aquino was very proud of that accomplishment. He worked hand in hand with Stanton Friedman, a man who claimed he never worked with the government, yet always says he helped develop nuclear flight. And he would say, well, we were in this program for nuclear flight because I was working for the government. But just remember, I never worked for the government. And we're talking about a man who was so brazenly uh, part of Aquino's satanic cult, uh, that he even cultivated the same hoarded eyebrow effect, which took a lot of Vaseline for Michael Aquino to do, and for Stanton Friedman to do as well. We have uh, a picture of that in the book, too, of Stanton yeah. Friedman and his member of the horned brow with his okay. satanic let's get, eyebrows. Let's get back to Roswell. Um, it was reported that there was materials that they could not cut or burn. Do you have any comments on that? 
Yes, I thought we were talking about Roswell, but certainly when it comes to the technology of the Japanese dirigibles, because of the high potential for flammability, they had asbestos-lined silk was the uh, general outline shell of the balloons that comprised the Aero Dreadnought. The Aero Dreadnought, of course, had advanced materials in the sense that they're rubberized and asbestos-lined silk uh, was... It was a miraculous to individuals who found it. They said it's flexible, looks like metal, but doesn't burn. This is because, by the way, the Americans, in order to be able to spot the aero dreadnoughts in flight at night, make certain they didn't lose them visually, they repainted them. They repainted them in a highly flammable nickel cadmium uh, coated paint uh, to make them reflective of all of the moonlight so that their planes could keep them in visual uh, throughout the night in case there was a breakout attempt, which they'd already been alerted to because of the escape of all the parasite craft, uh, the smaller parasite craft. It was carrying the larger parasite craft, the Manta bomber, when it blew. And this is why one aircraft was found in one area. The balloon material was found everywhere else and bodies were found elsewhere along with the dud atomic bomb that people thought was another spacecraft. Uh, all of this spread over miles because the explosion was enormous and it was composed of three separate parts, essentially, that uh, basically dislodged when it blew up. Uh, so when it comes to the, uh, the effect of this, uh, the Americans interpreted several different visions or scenarios for the crash over the years. The one in Texas happened before it, which was later on uh, remodeled into an alien affair. Uh, some elements that people have shown from that crash are literally uh, little fish bones that the Japanese ate, little fish. This was before they were captured. This one in Texas uh, uh, crashed before the Nagasaki bomb was dropped. Uh, so that was en route to what Americans know today as Area 51. Back then it was Tonopah Army Airfield. Uh, when it became Area 51, it was put under Air Force and CIA jurisdiction simultaneously, the CIA to cover all the secrets and the Air Force to take advantage of the terrain uh, for testing, uh, unconventional yeah. flight, which was what they were using it for when they tried to get the Japanese prisoners to show them how to use the dirigibles. So is the your materials quite- Is your contention that all UFO is, is this Japanese dirigibles? No, of course not. No, that's okay. preposterous. Um, so certainly, but, the you're, you're contending that the uh, Battle of L.A. and the and the uh, Roswell incident were Japanese, yeah. And, and many of the incidents where you had these crashes, where you had these crashes, like in Eli, Nevada, where you had them at Kingsman, Arizona. This is all captured Japanese technology. They brought over Germans to help interpret for the Japanese when they felt their English wasn't wouldn't suffice. Uh, the Japanese were always said to be in bandages or scarred terribly. This is because they tried to skin their tattoos off alive to torture them, to force them to fly the aircraft, <clears throat> at which point the Japanese, once in their aircraft, would simply kill themselves. Uh, so it, this explained all that rash of crashes that were very mechanical around the World War II era, which did not end until peace went into effect on, on August uh, 28th, uh, the birthday eve day of Emperor Hirohito in 1952. April, which, April, you know, April, 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 thank you. I, I always confuse August and April because of my Chinese and Japanese dialect. Uh, it's the, uh, the, they're very hard for me to con just... Uh, disambiguate the terms. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that being said, uh, that was on the birthday eve day, April, which is called Golden Week in Japan. Emperor Hirohito is the only emperor out of 2,600 years, about 3,000 years of emperors. Emperor Hirohito is the only emperor that gets a holiday uh, because he's known as the man who won World War II. Uh, so uh, this, he was the man who saved the Japanese race. Um, and he did that, of course, by being ruthless and uh, committing himself to a program uh, that uh, was, he was a combination of Hannibal Lecter and Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, and he outlived every other World War II leader and uh, led his empire to become economically second only after America for many decades. Yeah. Well, you present some interesting uh, evidence that those two uh, events may have been uh, certainly Japanese uh, churchables. Uh, it does fit in with some of the information that we have from those two uh, incidents. However, I, I am concerned that the uh, dirigible over Los Angeles did not get shot down. However, as I understand, there are multiple 
uh, balloons inside the dirigible. So even yes. though some are punctured, uh, the dirigible can still stay, stay up there. Oh, yes, very much so. It could lose half its balloons and still stay, stay aloft. They would have to drop a lot of ballast, and there would be plenty of Japanese willing to sacrifice themselves as ballast if it came to that. Uh, so uh, they easily flew back to Japan, which stretched all the way down to the equator at that point. It wasn't far from the Baja, <laughs> California, when they rode the equinoctial current home. And the Roswell incident, there was reported that they did find wood and uh i believe rice i don't paper. know they mentioned uh yeah rice, rice paper. paper yes so that and particularly these akuza um japanese fit in with what we considered to be uh, ets at that time uh they were about four feet tall and uh some of them badly burned so they probably were not recognized i want to say something else about um the whole mindset of people thinking that aliens would be in the same physical form we would be and think like us and be probing us like we would probe other areas. And they're reducing extraterrestrial consciousness or alien consciousness, whatever you want to term it, as being like us. And it's and then they are so incompetent that they're crashing all over the place. Uh, it, it's like we're being too egocentric to think of them as us when, in fact, what we're discussing here are us, just different racial types. Uh, with, and you got to remember, the, the civilization of Japan is like 2,000 years old. It, it, it's like it's a civilization that is, and I was just talking to a Marine today who wants to move to Japan. He says it is so incredible there. It is so civilized. Uh, this is a US Marine who I happen to know and wants to move his family there. He's it black, have... right? And he's black. No, he's not black. Well, oh, he is part a... black. I should, he is, he doesn't look black, but he is, he is, yeah. Yeah, he is. Uh, uh, can we open this up to some questions from our various- uh... Now we have a question here. Do we answer this fully? What about the unexplainable material or fabric found that you couldn't, Cut or burn. Did you answer that question, Douglas? Yes, sir. Now? Yes, okay. Peter. All right. Uh, so, folks, if you have questions, uh, I would suggest that you click on the reactions down below and uh, put in raise your hand like I'm doing here, and it brings you up into the upper left-hand corner. Uh, so I want to uh, let someone else uh, ask their questions, uh, if they have some. Uh, anybody want to step up to the plate and have any questions that they'd like to have answered? Um, and while we wait for that, I do want to emphasize, do note that the alien trope, the concept physiologically of the alien is Asian Sambo. The idea of large almond eyes, diminutive stature, the concept of no genitalia, the uh, concept of, uh, which of course is a Western imposition of their own sense of superiority, uh, <laughs> the uh, idea that they have that uh, uh, they're very smart but very fragile. Uh, there's no nose, uh, which is a joke I make. My father being white, I often tell fellow Asians that I can smell things they can't because I was born with a nose. Uh, it goes on and on. It's all an Asian physio stereotype that's been taken to an extreme to provide us the trope of the modern alien concept, all based on dead Asian bodies. Well, uh, I would argue that there are indeed uh, non- Japanese or non-Asian uh, ETs. There's a lot of evidence out there of various ET species, uh, which you're right. It's interesting that they do have the same, appear to uh, have the same physiognomy as we do. But I think that might be explained that there is a DNA portion that grows the body in that particular configuration that may be uh, pretty uh, pervasive through at least uh, our solar system, if not our galaxy, or even the universe. Um, there would be definitely organic evolutionary reasons why bodies would evolve to be efficient. And uh, the efficiency brings us back to a common template. Uh, yes. The point that I'm making is that the American perception of it as being peculiarly Asiatic as opposed to Negroid or Caucasoid 
is something that is a relic of the World War II era. Uh, however, I would point out there's an entire element we haven't gone into another time, perhaps, because it is relevant to ufology, where there are a, a there's an Asian minority group that was brought over after the end of the Vietnam War, along with the many uh, Laotian, Hmong, Montagnard, and various other emigres that does very much fit the gray physiotrope. No, I don't see Asian in the ET descriptions. Uh, perhaps you do, but maybe that's the way our brain is wired. But I, I don't see it the way you do. Um, okay, um, other comments? Um, certainly, uh, just raise your hand if you have anything you would like to ask or say. I can't believe that no one has uh, any comments on this. We had as many as uh, 43 people here at one time. Right now we're down to 27, so we did lose some folks. Um, but a very interesting presentation and uh, some nice ideas about what uh, may have happened at the uh, Battle of LA and Roswell certainly could make sense. Uh, I am concerned that uh, we have lots of evidence of additional uh, extraterrestrials around, uh, lots of uh, crashes of various uh, metallic uh, saucer-shaped uh, and not dirigible type uh, devices. Yes, this, this would go into, this would go mainly, mainly, mind you, into the mechanical capabilities of the thousand-year Reich in exile. Uh, the Americans were never able to preempt or prevent the Nazi exodus, or rather, as they refer to themselves, the inner Aryan exodus into the inner earth. And I refer to it as an inner earth pointedly, not a hollow earth. Yes. And um, they uh, conducted their own uh, space program. And the Americans were so desperate to prevent this that they launched Operation Argus. And Operation Argus launched no less than three nuclear weapons to generate an artificial Van Allen radiation belt which broke the logistical system between the Germans in space and the uh, civilization of Unterland for enough months to starve out the space elements at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. This was because, of course, the Americans never declared peace with the Third Reich. Um, the government set up in both East and West Germany were established by Allied occupation forces. The legal government was legally elected was the Third Reich. Uh, this is why Joseph Goebbels claimed to the Americans that uh, the Third Reich was recognized as the first people to send out television signals, why they even popularized that in the movie Contact with the first uh, signal at the edge of that shell of communications after the S sent out by Marconi, which was sent out uh, on the birthday of Emperor Showa, S, Hanson S, the Emperor of Japan, and Marconi and the Italians were already very much allying with Japan at the time. Uh, when you had that kind of uh, impetus, and then thereafter there follows Hitler speaking, uh, because they had the first statewide television programs, uh, then of course Goebbels was able to argue that the aliens received their signals first, and recognized them as the legitimate government of planet Earth. Uh, mm -hmm. The Americans and their allies were influenced by the Mazzi Project, started by the British, to investigate the UFOs, a lot of these, the Foo Fighters and what they called in Europe, the crop balls, which were very remote controlled uh, aerial equivalents of nautical landmines, multi-headed flares with the pyrokinetic coils that would buzz the allied planes exclusively and never bother Axis planes at all. <laughs> so when it came to the allies being uh, tormented by these uh, craft, uh, Goebbels used that as a backup for his claim. Uh, the aliens want us as the government to communicate with, they recognize us all, alone as the legitimate government of planet Earth. Then the allies also stepped back and stood down for that reason as well. Uh, but many of their craft, the Hanabu and various other means of anti-gravitic flight powered by technologies like Daiglok, which could be a uh, power for projection and motivation of aircraft or spacecraft as well as a bomb, uh, they were able to basically 
uh, maintain reconnaissance, and at times they got shot down. The Americans developed entire planes with rocket systems to shoot down the uh, German craft, succeeded every once in a while, but lost thousands of pilots uh, during the war with the, the Schiebkrieg, the Disc War, with the Thousand Year Reich in exile. Uh, we, we have somebody, uh, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Wall Wallish. Um, yeah. Do you have a comment? <clears throat> yeah, I, I got a boatload here, buddy. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for uh, joining us today. Uh, got a lot of history lessons. Uh, I love World War II. Uh, I follow it extensively. Um, but that's not my question. Um, I have a few questions. I mean, what are your thoughts of like what's going on today? I mean, we all live here in San Diego. I don't know where you guys live, but um, San Diego is known to be the number one hotspot in the world um, for uh, UAPs. Um, you know, there's all sorts of kinds. I, I've i narrowed it down. I've done a lot of research over the years. There's triangular crafts. There's uh, other saucer crafts. There's some that are believed to be believed by um, propulsion by, you know, certain chemicals. There's others by, by magnetics, um, you know. Um, you know, and you got people that also believe that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, crafts are hidden in plain, plain day sight. You know, uh, we, we've explored more of the moon than we have of the, the bottom of the ocean. Quite true. Um, so. I, uh, I would also point out, though, that San Diego is is most known for, you know, being one of the biggest naval and military centers, to say nothing of when you get up into the, the desert of California, you're you're loaded with military installations yeah. in that area. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I've never seen one since moving here 10 years ago. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we all saw the Tic Tac video. We all saw the other video where it uh, submerges itself itself um you know i watch a lot of videos i don't know if any of you have seen the movie the documentary moment of contact in brazil in 1997 um you know i'm one of those people that believe i would love to see a ufo i i thought i saw one years ago up in yellowstone um, but you know, these people are people like, yeah, I'd love to see a UFO, but now when they were interviewed, you could see the terror in their eyes that like, I wish I never saw this. Right. Um, uh, you know, do, you, do so, you have a question for our speakers? Oh, he asked it. He asked it. He was saying, what about today's situation with ufology? What is it that people are seeing? So understand that, uh, when it comes to the, uh, our our world's oceans, which cover seventy five percent of the world's surface, approximately, uh, there as people understand, far less explored than outer space. Uh, the doctor, well, he was a uh, I forget his rank, but he was a uh, definitely around uh, the rank of a colonel. Uh, he was Ivan Sanderson. Ivan Sanderson was a British information intelligence officer who was posted in the uh, Bermuda region, uh, in Belize, actually, what used to be British Guiana, and uh, no, uh, British um, Central America. And uh, he, of course, was- British director. Honduras, British Honduras. Thank you so much, thank you. And uh, he- Yeah, uh, I was just on, in Honduras a few wonderful. months ago. I didn't see a UFO though. <laughs> Un understood. But he concluded that many ships were disappearing due to Invisible Residence, which is a book which is recommended reading. And he spoke of undersea civilizations of non-terrestrial intelligences, NTIs, that have definitely evolved. And uh, they're down there. And they're responsible for many of the more spectacular USOs, our uh, unidentified submersible objects. 
uh, most of what we're seeing are the product of relic populations that survived the mass extinction uh, in Uterland. Uh, these are populations whose uh, descendants don't even know most of the technology that they're still working. It's the reason for some of their crashes. They're working these as legacy heirlooms. They don't technologically understand what they're dealing with anymore. It's very sad, and sometimes their bodies are found. Uh, so uh, this is a factor. This is a factor. And some of what people see are extra dimensional. These are the uh, craft changing morphology. Uh, they're entering from a different dimension. They're not physically accessible to missiles or uh, rocket ships. Uh, rockets, I mean to say, I do uh, want to point out something about what I'm much more familiar with, even though I can go to town on these relic populations for reasons of Aquino's own interest in them, and I was in liaison with him and exposed to so much I was never supposed to be exposed to, and a lot of this had to do with American Department of Defense corruption, uh, is that uh, basically we had uh, in the 1950s, uh, uh, between the 1940s and the 1950s, these German aerocraft interfering with the American launch program. Uh, when it came to people like Werner von Braun, most people don't know his brother Magnus went to work for the Soviets. This was intentional. Uh, they helped to sabotage both the American and Russian space program, so they effectively went nowhere. Uh, the Germans, on the other hand, would also interfere with missile launches. And uh, when it comes down to the war they fought with America... Uh, between the late 1940s and 1950s in the disc war, the Americans lost over 2,000 American pilots. Now, a lot of these were lost on record as in conflict with UFOs. Uh, this includes uh, uh, men who survived the Korean War and uh, had seen a lot of air combat, had won air medals because they were aces. They had to shoot down at least five enemy planes to earn that title. Uh, when it comes to uh, such men, they're fighting World War II on American soil in American skies. Uh, and what the Americans developed was the F-94 Starfire Interceptor in response. Uh, this was uh, firing uh, uh, eight-pound warheads. Uh, each rocket uh, was 20 pounds. Uh, and, of course, they fired these off in salvos. And hundreds of these rockets would fly from a squadron of F-94 uh, interceptors. And even though prevailing winds would knock them um, down back to the home soil of America and kill Americans, and many Americans died therefrom in the battle in our skies, they managed to down Nazi flying saucers. Uh, all of this is fact. Uh, people can look it up in terms of the circumstantial evidence. It's all out there. Uh, now, the amazing thing about what I say is how many people emotionally respond to it with anger. When we lose half our audience, uh, in a sense, that's an accomplishment because these people are responding emotionally. They shut down because they can't argue with the overwhelming evidence we're presenting logically. So understand that while I may have anger issues, bear in mind what I didn't complete saying about my father and my mother uh, they were not allowed to legally marry due to the Uniform Code of, Mi of Military Justice, UCMJ. My father was part of a class action lawsuit that went all the way up to the American Supreme Court to get the Uniform Code of Military Justice declared unconstitutional. Until that time, people like Marlon Brando helped to make films like Sayonara, which was about the many military suicides taking place because Americans couldn't marry Asian women overseas legally. Their marriages were annulled, uh, rendered illegitimate by the United States. So here I am. If I had arrived in America uh, before the overturning of the miscegenation laws, I would have been an illegal baby. It's one of the reasons I was allowed to come to the United States was because they overturned those laws. And the only reason my parents were able to get married was because the Uniform Code of Military Justice was overturned. Do you expect me to feel some sort of gratitude to you, all as Americans, and somehow sugarcoat? You're losing the war. It's absurd. No, I it, don't think uh, that was the reason people were leaving. I think they were maybe more interested in uh, the MUFON portion where we were interested in your discussion of UFOs and Roswell and the, uh, I understand and the Battle of L.A. And appreciate it, unfortunately, we didn't himself. get to that until 
much well, much later. It requires and, context. All of yes, this requires I, I, context. I understand that. And Peter and Moon you, himself was reading the questions, and most of the questions were, "Peter, help me out here." Were were there not a lot of comments saying, "Oh, oh, the messenger is hostile," etc. Well, yeah, I mean, they are responding emotionally. There's no question about it because everything that you have to say is hidden knowledge, and it you know it upsets people uh, emotionally because they're going through ontological shock it's it's like what an alcoholic goes through when you say oh your father's an alcoholic and you've been in denial about it that so much of the information you've been taking in is you being manipulated it upsets people it's visceral and, and understand I these films like independence day these films like the battle of los angeles the fictional account these are genuine military units flying those jets flying those helicopters. These aren't actors in those cockpits. These aren't actors deploying from those military helicopters in either of those films or the many other alien propaganda films of the United States military industrial entertainment complex. They are not just using these as recruiting videos. These are essentially propaganda films in the World War II sense to make you think it's the aliens yeah. because they lost <clears throat> the war. The Americans occupied Japan, quote unquote, the Japanese call it reconstruction, and the Americans were undoing the damage that they did, all the while that they were fighting the Japanese in China. My Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm a history buff myself here, yes. and I, I understand Japan was brutal, beyond brutal, that we can't even comprehend how brutal japan was to their adversaries i yes. guess i guess my question was um like where do you guys stand now when it when we we have these reports um mm -hmm. and i think they're just going to come out more and more everybody's got an iphone everybody's capturing this stuff um there appears to be five six seven eight maybe more different types of vessels that people are seeing but they're all fitting the exact same description mm -hmm. um like where where do you guys where do you personally see this going in the next five years uh, understand um first thing to explain is that um my mother was half japanese half chinese myself i'm a quarter japanese quarter chinese but i'm born i was born a taiwanese national a national a national of the nationalist republic of china so in that Taiwan's sense Taiwan's awesome i've been there i love it thank you i appreciate that profoundly i can never return for reasons i explain another time the point that I'm making is that Taiwan was part of Japan for over half a century and very Japanized. In terms of the Japanese culture in World War II, they were excessively brutal. They were inhumanly cruel by any other person's understanding based on arbitrary evidence. But there's a logic. They were saving the entire Asian race from genocide. Once the Americans would unleash their anti-life bias idols from Fort Detrick, that would have wiped out Asians of any race. It would not have distinguished between Japanese, Chinese, or any other ethnos. If the Japanese hadn't done what they did, there wouldn't be Asians alive on Earth today. And if, if, I'm, if I'm listening correctly, like a lot of this conversation started around World War II, pre-World yeah. War II. And now we're in after. World War III. Now we're in World War III. Not only are we fighting a continuation of the Second World War against the thousand-year Reich in exile, communist China now is the challenger in the Pacific and the world. So where we see this going is the communist Chinese taking advantage of what the Japanese did. And they're threatening America with a balloon siege. And they're showing the Americans what the Japanese didn't do, we can do. So they're threatening America directly. Understand sure. that, of course, America's allies are Taiwan and Japan. But it's not for any sentimentality that you have to side with them. It's because your life depends on it. Taiwan, the nation where I was born, is the most scientifically and technologically advanced civilization on earth they produce 90 percent of all your high-end semiconductors 
It's a beautiful country. Thank you. I appreciate that. But if it falls, your planes fall out of the sky, your satellites fall out of orbit, your cars stop, your pacemakers stop beating, and your world crumbles around you. So, yeah, they make the Taiwan semiconductors. I'm, yes. I'm well aware. Um, yes. And um, uh, the lasers that make that possible are manufactured only in Germany. So understand that when the Russians invaded Ukraine, which contains 25% of all the world's black soil that's able to produce a surplus, they were aiming to control with their own breadbasket half the world's food supply. And Ukraine is where neon gas comes from, which is what makes the laser's ability to render the microchip, well, uh, <clears throat> incision, possible at all. If the Russians take Ukraine and the Chinese take Taiwan, they rule your world. This is a third world war and your lives depend on defending my Taiwan. That's where we stand today. The empire of Japan stands with you. Yeah, and I'm not sure if I got any other people raising their hands or whatnot. Um, they might, like, but I'll count on other people to bring it to my attention. Yeah, I, I don't see anybody else raising their hands. I mean, just your honest opinion. Um, what what do you believe is is visiting us right now? I mean, do you believe that there are ufos or aliens living on this planet right now or do you think they're just here scoping it out as, as i said we have relic populations in the massive caverns of winterland that uh continue to reconnoiter our skies uh we have civilizations beneath the ocean that continue to interact as indirectly as possible with uh our surface world we live on the surface world, but much of it sources from here, which is why sometimes it crashes. No one's going to yeah. travel from light years and just have an accident. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I completely like, agree. And when I, when I said San Diego, you're like, well, you know, San Diego's got military and yada, yada. Um, but, you know, I know from my homework over the last five, ten years, that, uh, you know, military people are no-nonsense guys. They don't, they don't take a joke. Um, they, they don't know how to joke. Um, and they go on record. We obviously had that press club um, not too many years ago. They all said their story. They all said their piece. They all said that, you know, um, these UFOs were shutting down nuclear missile silos. Yes. Um, ten at a time, and never one has been gone off at once. And maybe that's an anomaly. Maybe it was just that's the thousand year Reich in exile that has a vested interest in preventing, in in demonstrating show of force and show of capabilities. Um, aliens coming to Earth from far, far away wouldn't really have that level of cultural sophistication. Uh, it requires nuance. It requires an understanding of where to hit the enemy, where it hurts. The psychological impact of that is something the Thousand Year Reich understands from years of warfare with the United States. If you take a look at your phone receipt, it still has a phone tax on it from World War II, from back in the days when women used to have to jack in plugs to connect a phone in order to prevent them from overstressing themselves with unnecessary calls. They initiated a phone tax. That phone tax is still in effect because we're still at war. Uh, you have, of course, war time, which is known as daylight saving time now. Uh, war time was originated in World War I. It lasted the single year America participated in the war, and the Americans demanded its cessation. Uh, they reintroduced it under Roosevelt, who had every intention of going to war. And uh, when he did so, we were never taken off wartime. Neither were any of the other allies. Uh, but Japan doesn't use daylight saving time. Because it won the war. <laughs> yeah. uh, Dave, David, uh, let me ask you. So you don't believe that any of these uh, UFOs are coming from off off our planet? Uh, you think they're all coming from our planet? No, not at all. Um, there are many things from deep space. The deep space would involve, say, for instance, these morphologically changing UFOs, which cannot be shot down. 
uh, where projectiles are going straight through them because they're coming out of a different space-time continuum where when you're going through space, you're going through time. What we are seeing are their three-dimensional shadows. They're in the fourth dimension and fifth dimension of time and space. So we're seeing their shadow in three dimensions, but our projectiles go through them as if bullets were hitting a shadow. So that is something that's obviously out there. Uh, when it comes to the other uh, phenomenon, no one ever speaks of very much, but they should, when it's obviously organic, when it's ectoplasmic, when it is morphologically extending uh, various tendrils. These are various organic organisms that exist in hard vacuum, and they live off detritus or the various debris that's found in deep space. Uh, these are like amoeboid or other types of potentially multicellular animals. Uh, we see them crash once in a while. Some of them are uh, terrestrial in nature, others from hard vacuum. But the Crawfordsville monster was an example of one. When astronomers spot entire uh, migrations of these creatures and have put them on record, uh, the only one who really ca kept track of it was a military colonel uh, retired by the name of James Trevor Constable, who was very much a, uh, a, a devotee of Dr. Wilhelm Reich. And uh, he interpreted these in a manner that was within that Reichian paradigm, uh, but his records are extraordinarily helpful in kind of a cryptozoological sense. Uh, you won't find anything about them online of any substance, so the books of James Trevor Constable are required reading. Yeah. Uh, so there's another example. So these are sourcing from everywhere, basically. Yeah. David Adair uh, has told me that he was asked to uh, check out a UFO, and he went up and touched it and said it's alive, that the actual UFO ship was a, a biological, um, or maybe mechanical bio Okay, device. potentially biomechanical. Yeah. Right. But the other thing is that we're told about possible wormholes, which could explain how we could get to very distant places without uh, having to travel. Well, um, yeah, in either case, you're dealing with an extra dimensional technology at that point. At that yes. point, you're entering mm -hmm. a subspace or hyperspace. So uh, when it comes to these, I do tell people, however, um, many of these are our descendants from the future who have uh, colonized the galaxy or parts thereof, and they come back here because this is the genetic baseline. Uh, as you adapt to space, your entire, uh, well, your genetics change, obviously, and uh, you would need to evolve differently on other worlds. But here on Earth, they have to travel back in time. If anyone has an interstellar empire, it has to also be a chronotic or intertemporal or extratemporal, meaning time-based empire. This is based on technology that Peter Moon has written about. Now, whether or not we comprehend that, understand that space is vast enough where people not only agree to a certain rendezvous point to maintain an empire, they have to agree to meet at a certain time, meaning they will rendezvous at a specific time in terms of calendrical years. And this is why the crop circles, they are bookmarks. Crop circles are intricate, the ones that are real, uh, and they're generated in a fashion where they serve as bookmarks in time. This is how the time traveling uh, descendants of ours visiting Earth to harvest our genes to maintain their populations in baseline are able to mark where and when they are. Yeah, we're getting into areas that can be complete three-hour discussions at other times. So uh, the, this whole UFO thing branches out into many, many different uh, areas that each one is a complete uh, total study in itself. Thank All right, you. Um, Mr. Wallace, is that the end of your questions, or do you have more? Well, yeah, I mean, I could ask him all day, uh, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll keep it quick because I know we're over the time limit, but... And if you... Peter if Peter wants to leave, I'm uh, he's it's no, no, midnight no, where I'm, he's I'm at. I'm okay, I'm okay, I just, I thought he was wrapping up. I could, stay, I could stay for as long as you wish. I mean, do you feel like these crafts or whoever we're seeing whatever they're doing do you believe that they are friendly or do you believe they're just gathering data or do you believe that they are just um gathering data for strategic purpose to take over the planet 
Um, when it comes to the relic populations, the survivors of other mass extinctions from millions and millions of years ago, they would definitely be hostile. They consider themselves the true heirs to Earth, and we're an infestation. When it comes to uh, our descendants from the future, they're harvesting us for practical reasons, maintaining a genetic baseline that is continually evolving in hard vacuum or on other planets. The thousand-year Reich in exile, which when they appear, appear as Nordics, they're harvesting genes from uh, human beings for a very specific reason, maintaining a sense of immunity to the diseases on the surface world. Their subterranean environment is so sterile that any invasion of Unterland would wipe them out by disease, the way the conquistadors wiped out the Aztecs and the Incas before any conventional weapons would really do any damage. So in order to maintain some sense of immunity in case they need to defend themselves or should they decide to invade the surface world, they need to harvest genes from us at various times as our bodies evolve to new diseases, to counter new diseases. And that's pragmatic. It's pragmatic. And uh, when it comes to the alien greys, they're definitely hostile. Now, I've already talked about the Asian uh, mimetic, the trope, the stereotype, but there is a reality to all stereotypes. And that involves, of course, this Asian minority group that I alluded to earlier, the Chochoa, which I've gone in uh, long detail to in the past on my own program. And uh, they're inimical. Uh, of course, they work with the U.S. government uh, for a fee, and that's feeding off of human substance, essence, uh, your life force, in effect. Uh, as a shill, uh, Whitley Strieber was employed by the U.S. government. Uh, Aquino told me this himself. He's the man who employed him. And he was describing the Cho, an Asian minority uh, <laughs> ethnic group of emigres, as aliens. But they're responsible for many of the abductions. Think on the statistics, the demography. Mostly Europeans encounter so Nordics. you believe in abductions? Mostly Americans encounter greys. Mm. Go on. Uh, uh, you know, before we close up, uh, I'd like to give uh, Peter Moon an opportunity to uh, discuss uh, some of the books or whatever you would like to talk about, uh, Peter. Uh, we're kind of running out of time, but uh, yeah, I get, wanna, thank you. I want to give us your like uh, Twitter handles or and stuff like that. Thank you. Well, since I've been banned off Facebook myself. Uh, the Japanese pornographic actress, the most famous actress in Japan, Sora Aoi, when she got married and retired, gave me her Facebook timeline. Uh, you can still find me as Douglas D. Dietrich on Facebook, but you're going to find this timeline of what was formerly Sora Aoi. Uh, so go to Douglas D. Dietrich uh, with capital D's. Everything else is lowercase. Uh, three capital D's, Douglas D. Dietrich on Facebook, and you'll find me. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can find me on YouTube. Look up Douglas Dietrich, and I'm ubiquitous, even though I've been scrubbed repeatedly. Uh, and, of course, uh, uh, you can join us there on Sundays and Wednesdays. Uh, we hope Will Wakely will join us sometimes. Uh, and uh, as for my email and physical mailing address, uh, they're all available at douglasdietrich.com. Just go to douglasdietrich.com. You'll find um, other means to communicate with me. Um, and my email address is long and complicated, as Will Wakely can attest. You might uh, want to put that up on the chat, uh, Doug. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And Peter, take it from here. Tell people how they can contact you and your other books that, you know, skybooksusa.com, where people can get our book on discount. Okay. I want to thank you uh, for uh, hosting us and in, in indulging in a in a very controversial uh, subject matter. Thank you uh, very much for having us. And well, we thank you for uh, bringing this uh, program to our attention. It's, it's very interesting stuff. Now, I'm basically known for uh, my work with the Montauk Project and Time Travel. Uh, website is skybooksusa.com where you can purchase the book, The Roswell Deception and the Demystification of World War II. It's still on sale. And you can go to Amazon.com and read it on Kindle, or you can order it from Amazon.com 
I know what, what, was the, what was the first one before Roswell deception? The Montauk Project Experiments in Time. Okay, thanks. Now, I also uh, wanted to draw your attention as an engineer. I have something very important, uh, the Time Travel Education Center, because uh, since the Montauk Project, uh, all of the work I've done, written several sequels to that book, which a lot, have a lot to do with synchronicity, the principle of synchronicity, but one of the most interesting people I've ever met is Dr. David Anderson, uh, who had a time travel research laboratory on Long Island, he befriended me. He's now in the Southwest and has a Anderson Institute, but I uh, dumbed down his uh, presentation into seven free videos you can uh, look at at the timetraveleducationcenter.com which demonstrate that time travel is within the bounds of ordinary mathematics and physics. Ordinary, all you need to know is the Pythagorean theorem to grasp this. And uh, th this is something, as an engineer, we can have a discussion about this uh, it, privately and, and perhaps publicly, uh, if you're interested. Um, so so the, the time, uh, David has developed his time reactor it's called i have a, a patent application for his time reactor uh, that's free and available um that actually there's an actual working time machine uh that i've only seen a video of an early prototype for it it's there's a lot of censorship around it but this technology is all here it's all in front of us it's coming age uh of now now as pluto moves into aquarius we're now in the age of star trek technology coming online We'll see this for the next 10 years. So that's what I have to say. Skybooksusa.com, The Roswell Deception. I've got a host of other books and whatnot. Uh, nice to be with you. Nice to meet you. Uh, and and uh, you too. Before uh, we go, I definitely want to emphasize the fact that Mr. Will Wakeley himself is on to some things that I won't specify, but he may help us enter this new age of uh, physical concepts and uh, reconceptualization that will nicely uh, help, uh, uh, well, uh, make uh, Dr. David Lewis Anderson's work realizable. Uh, before um, we go, uh, Will, I do pray that you did record this entire event, and we'd love to know where we can provide links for our friends, Peter Moon and I. Um, will you be able to send us this link? or will? Uh, unfortunately, I started the recording. Oh, you didn't record it, of course. No, it is recorded, but it started late. However, yes, you, you started the you started about two hours in. No, no, about one hour in. So uh, yeah, I I figured that. Yes, it was like a half an hour in, I think. No, it was about two hours in, from what I remember. Well, we missed from the most what majority. I recall, it was one hour in, and at that point, you hadn't discussed anything at all about the UFOs. So, but there was a lot of good information that you did provide at that time. You, you so, know, every 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 interview I conduct, they never record it. Oh no, I did record. <laughs> And the recording will be made available, and I'll but send the recording's a not link complete. to it. The hey, Douglas, I tell you what, next time you have a you have a Zoom meeting, I'll record it. Just send me a link. I feel so much better. Hey, uh, every but, time I conduct an interview, they always do the same thing. Uh, they never open the recording, and it's never recorded. It was not purposeful. It's just that I tend to forget to turn on the recorder whenever we start yeah, a meeting. There's two focus on muting, muting people because people start making uh, popcorn of popcorn. <laughs> yeah, but understanding context of my experience, yeah, it's too much part of the pattern. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, thank you. Thank we you. All, and... We all got it. Uh, I just wanted to ask a real quick question. Sure. And you can make it as quick and brief as you want. Um, my real question is, um, as far as like this disclosure since day one, uh, my my gut instinct after all my research and this and that has always been like you know the the masses eighty five percent are probably maybe even less maybe seventy five percent are ready for disclosure to say hey like there's others out there like God did not just create us only. Um, but my my fear is the reason that disclosure has been pushed out so far is just because of the religious religious zealots out there that uh, may cause a lot of trouble, unforeseen trouble. 
Um, so the, the religious zealots would simply adapt like everybody else. Your average individual doesn't care about illegal aliens flipping their burgers. They wouldn't care if they well, came from Alpha Centauri. Well, uh, they, so they will adapt, but uh, they're just like everything else. People do not like the change. Well, we, we it, had a program a couple months ago by a uh, theologian, and his point was, that most religious people said it would not bother them. Disclosure would not bother them, but it would bother their friend. And yeah. from that, oh, we uh, it, it, determined it really will not be a big problem. Yeah. Uh, I agree with you that a lot of people are now willing to accept that there may be extraterrestrials. And I, I, uh, I don't think that it's going to be a big problem. I don't think they're belligerent. Uh, there may be some species that are. But from what I understand, uh, they are not in control now, that the good guys are now in control, and that there may be a uh, disclosure coming hopefully soon. Uh, there were a lot of good reasons why it was kept secret, and still some good reasons why it should be kept secret. Uh, I, I, think I think losing uh, World War II has a lot to do with it, yes. Oh, let, me, let me interject here. Uh, what I would tell you is you, what you are hearing right now is disclosure. You yeah. are hearing disclosure right Thank now yeah. that the government has not been telling you. This but understand, is, we can't get the word out because every time we're interviewed by someone, they don't record it. So when you started the recording late, how do Peter and I get, uh, are you going to email us a link, which we yes. can share with our friends? Um, yes. I hope um, you're going to publish this at all. Uh, what I do is I put it up on uh the cloud and you can get it from the cloud i don't know how to do that and well, neither does peter i'll, I'll show you yeah, how. sure sure we can i can get it from the cloud. i'll show you how to do it okay oh you. uh i'd like to say something i'd like to say i can tell it i'd like to say something to will i um i believe everything you just said the good guys are in control right now the good guys the good aliens and the good and the good angels they're all in control right now all in control and um for me i really believe that um we're going to see some really really good overwhelming good things happen not in this country not just in this country but all over the world that the whole the whole human life all life on this planet human life animal life uh insect life are all going to benefit in ways that it's just such it's such overwhelming we can't even um it just can't even can't even imagine you know it's just you know like it's you said nice before like 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 <laughs> you, yeah yeah like you said before we're living in a star trek star wars world and and this this is this uh this this is what's happening right now i hope you're right ken I hope you're right. <laughs> well, I certainly want to thank you uh, both, uh, Peter and Douglas, for giving us a very interesting uh, presentation tonight. It, well, uh, I, I was went on longer than I, 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 I left the party with people that I appreciate the company of to come here and not be recorded for the greater part of what I said. I do hope you understand this is impacts my ability to trust you in the future. Well, I'm sorry about that. I, I should put up a. a postal note on my monitor that says start the recording at the beginning and unfortunately i get involved in other things and forget to do that however i did start it at um at 7 30. which is an hour oh. and a half in no no it, it started hmm. one hour in we started uh, but, at six yeah unfortunately you had not uh discussed anything at all about the uh, extraterrestrial or UF up to that point. It was essentially historical at that point, but very interesting information, Douglas. Uh, believe me. It's necessary context, yes. It was, it was very good and very informational and uh, very important for us to know. But, well, uh, I, I know that uh, it's not the best for you there, uh, Douglas Dietrich, but, you know, if Will does send you another link, mm -hmm. um, you know, you could also do the same um you mean splice it 
do something no, before it to lay the content. Or you could do like the first half an hour and then, yeah. yeah splice um, it with something that I do to provide context that is otherwise eliminated. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. That will save a lot of time. But I you know, won't it, remember it. It was an honest time. mistake. You know, we all had to help uh, Will find the, the mute button. So. Uh, this. I understand there. it was not deliberate. Uh, I understand that, that but yeah. it, the problem is it's in context of every experience I've had. Well, I'm sorry. To this hear has happened oh, just, every interview. Is just, that just, no one just one more car? Just one more comment here. I hope everyone has watched been watching the new season of Ancient Aliens. Of well, this this season has been I thought was very very good. So uh, real good. Also. Um, we got a uh, new Skinwalker Ranch is coming on, no, plus me. new, new um, the unexplained is coming on. Also, too, they're doing it like we. Are, I think it was our last meeting. Don't forget, there's going to be a whole new documentary coming on uh, on on um, on the History Channel too. What so I want you to understand is that the History Channel is a completely co-opted government agenda. Thank you. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's what the it Office is. of War Information. Yeah, it is the I, Office yeah. of War Information. Yeah, it, it's it's propaganda, but I do have to say it to everybody that's still listening. Um, the the documentary that really drove everything home to me was Moment of Contact, uh, the sighting in 1997 in Brazil where they cite uh, a lot of the people that saw the craft that. Um, I will tell you that uh, I do read people for a living. Um, that's my job um, to tell if they're bullshitting or if they're telling the truth. And I give my insight to the, the, the DEA. And uh, a lot of these people in Moment of Contact, it's a documentary. You can find it on Netflix or Amazon Prime. It's like $2.99. Um, you will be blown away. Um, it, it, you Thank can, you for see, you can see the terror in the eyes of these people that always wish they wanted to see UFOs and they saw a UFO, and now they wish they never saw a UFO. I, I, I they saw actual imagine. creatures, is that correct? Uh, that they saw the actual creatures, they're little gray creatures with three fingers, two toes. Oh my, uh, but they the were not that, Japanese, the, I, from what I uh, that, understand. The guy that tackled one of them um, died of a mysterious illness a year or no, a week and a half ago. Um, they smelled like sulfur and vinegar. Everyone in the documentary stated that they had to disinfect the whole hospital um, for months because they could not get the stench out of the smell of the hotel. Um, but they said these were creatures of not this world. Um, okay. There's no question that, that this stuff happens, uh, yeah. that this is part of a, a terror program that they're running on people. Thank you. And, and also, I would tell you, the History Channel knows all about my work. And they know it extensively. Uh, they will sandbag it, me. They will not is, have me on. And but I've got information that is so fast would fascinate the hell out of their audience with the stuff that's happened in Romania, but they uh, blacklist me. They've been doing this for twenty plus years. So what I'm saying is they are dedicated completely to not informing the public. And what they are doing is we I can go deeper into that. what they're doing here, but we don't have time for it uh, with this story that you're talking about. But, yeah, th this is this is Men in Black, but this is a this is a documentary that uh, went out of his way. He's not affiliated to anybody but himself. Uh, you better uh, believe. I, I hope you're getting a commission better from believe him. <laughs> yeah, at any you rate, have no, you have no documentation that he's not affiliated. Well, you guys are affiliated to people just like other people are affiliated to people, but these guys <clears> they <throat> did it on their own. So you you watch it and you will see. And I'm telling you, I've watched thousands of videos. Yes, I've watched thousands of appreciated. videos, and I, I've, I've listened to your whole speech, and I take everything with a grain of salt. 
Uh, <laughs> look into you. the history. Look yeah. into the history. The actual yeah. history. Yeah. All you have to do We're is not, don't take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. Look into the history. Verify everything well, I say. I, the circumstantial I know, evidence is there. I know a lot about. Uh, I watch World War II World videos all World day World long. World yes, War. thank you. Yeah, World, delightful. World War stuff too, all the time. Yeah, look, all, all of that is based on what historians have access yeah. to. Yeah, and so I even earnest I, or sincere historians have very limited understanding of any context of World War II, especially about World War II in yeah, Asia. I May I go it, now? I don't say it as yeah. bad. I, I, I read <laughs> this you. propaganda. Uh, this, this propaganda. Uh, at any rate, will I? I definitely uh, look forward to whatever you manage to capture, and I I find it offensive that you say you weren't talking about ufos everything we were talking about is relevant well to it, it, later came into the unfortunately topic. unfortunately and, many people yeah. thought that we were going to be discussing ufos mainly and it's, it's I like think from whatever little, paradigm they have yeah. but i'm here to disclose right i'm here to disclose i'm not here to cater to what they want no. so um i did well, i thank you i thank you i did for expect uh, your presentation I did expect respect from the interviewer to the point where what I'm saying would be taken seriously. I hope you understand why I'm angry. Well, just I, understand I, that I this, hope the point is this happens every time. Well, this happens every time. You have to understand it was not deliberate on my part. It was un. That doesn't forcing. help. That doesn't help. I know, I know. But I will make sure you get a copy of uh, what we do have recorded. Please. Uh, which is uh, probably about two or two and a half hours worth of uh, of our interview yeah and about a half hour worth of mumbling at the end uh great yeah it's, well, anyway, it's big... thank you thank you for having us <laughs> yes okay thank well you. thank you again and thank you folks for uh staying we still have 24 uh, people who are who stayed on and by the way time Peter's we being, had as many Peter's as 43 very polite but uh 